Putin, cometh the hour, cometh the man. Almost everyone now recognizes that Russia's military intervention in Syria to defeat the so-called Islamic State terror group was the right call to make. Russian President Vladimir Putin isn't crowing about it. He doesn't have to. By Finian Cunningham for Sputnik on Information Clearinghouse November 18, 2015 Putin's vindication was made clear by the enthusiastic reception afforded to him at the summit of G20 leaders in Turkey last weekend. The Financial Times headlined, Putin transformed from outcast to problem solver at G20. The paper went on to note that an audience with the Russian president was one of the hottest tickets in town as Western leaders were forced to recognize the road to peace in Syria inevitably runs through Moscow. Even U.S. President Barack Obama was seen to confer with Putin as the two leaders held an impromptu and earnest face-to-face -face discussion on the sidelines of the summit. It was a constructive encounter with none of the antagonism that Washington has all too often displayed towards Putin over the past year. The Paris terror assault, with 129 dead and hundreds wounded in simultaneous gun and bomb attacks, no doubt concentrated the minds of world leaders attending the G20 conference held in Turkey, Turkey's Antalya, only two days after the mass killings. The atrocity was claimed by the Islamic State Terror Network, also known as ISIS or ISIL, with seven of its operatives killed in the suicide attacks. Days later, the conclusion by Russian investigators this week that a terrorist bomb was the cause of the Russian civilian airliner crash on October 31 over Egypt's Sinai Desert, with the loss of all 224 people on board, has only added to the grim public realization about ISIL and its affiliates. French President Francois Hollande, who skipped the G20 summit due to the emergency situation unfolding at home, appealed this week for a, quote, global coalition to defeat Islamic State. This was made during a special address to both upper and lower houses of the French Parliament at the Pella de Versailles. The French leader called on the U.S. and Russia to join forces along with France and other countries. Hollande is to fly to Washington on November 24 to discuss with Obama how to coordinate efforts at combating ISIL in Syria and Iraq. Two days after that, the French president is due in Moscow to hold the same discussion with Putin. Putin has already acknowledged the appeal from Hollande, saying that he welcomes closer cooperation, adding that Russia has been consistently calling for a greater joint effort in combating terrorism. Putin has even reportedly offered Russian naval coordination with the French aircraft carrier Charles de Gaulle in the eastern Mediterranean for future airstrikes against ISIL within days of the Paris massacre. French warplanes launched extensive strikes against Islamic State bases in eastern Syria. Russia and its Syrian ally have pointed out that previous military strikes by the U.S. and France are in violation of international law since those operations do not have consent from the government in Damascus. It remains to be seen, then, how Russia would coordinate military operations in Fran with France in Syria owing to the le legal implications. Since the Paris mayhem, several French political figures and former military intelligence personnel have urged Hollande to rethink policy on Syria. Opposition leader Nicolas Sarkozy, among others, said that, quote, to not coordinate with Russia is absurd. A think tank, CF2R, with close links to French military intelligence, also advised the Hollande government to view the Syrian leader not as the enemy and to dedicate efforts in conjunction with Russia on destroying the ISIL and related groups. In other words, Russia is being proven right about its intervention in Syria, the most effective way to defeat the terror networks of ISIL and other jihadist groups like the Nusra Front, is to support the Syrian state to coordinate with the Syrian Arab army on the ground and to target the militants with a full-on campaign. 
This is why Putin was received at the G20 summit with a newfound respect among other leaders. When Putin ordered the Russian military intervention in Syria, beginning on September 30, it was not done in half measures. In a matter of weeks, the Russian Air Force has achieved more in terms of wiping out terror groups than the U.S.-led coalition did in more than a year of airstrikes. Russian's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov noted in an interview this week that the U.S.-led bombing supposedly against the Islamic State has been ineffective due to its conflicting priorities. Lavrov said that since August 2014, the Western so-called anti-ISIL coalition was focused on weakening the Damascus government and therefore it did not strike decisively at ISIL formations because they are seen as assets in the Western effort for regime change. Some analysts go further and argue that the Islamic State and associated jihadist mercenaries are the result of covert Western sponsorship of these groups. Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and other Gulf Arab states are known to have been major funders and facilitators of the jihadist brigades. Putin highlighted these links at the G20 summit when he announced that the financing of the terror networks in Syria has come from, quote, 40 states, including members of the G20. Thus, while Russia has been vindicated in its strategy and tactics on Syria, the appeal for a global coalition against terror has intrinsic limits. This is because key Western powers and their regional allies are committed in principle against such a R Russian defined front. The United States, Britain, and France are among those states insisting that the Syrian President Bashar al-Assad has to relinquish power sooner or later. Russia rejects that demand as a violation of Syrian sovereignty. These western states are also known to have supplied weapons, at least indirectly, to the jihadist terror groups. British leader David Cameron complained at the G20 summit that Russia has hit, quote, non-ISIL opposition to Assad, people who could be part of the future of Syria. But who or where are these non-ISIL groups that Cameron says could be a part of the future of Syria? When Russia has asked the West for information and locations on moderate rebels to avoid in its airstrikes, the West has refused to provide any details. France is as guilty as any other group of the foreign states for fueling a covert war in Syria that has spawned the terror problem of Islamic State and its affiliates. The problem that has, in turn, rebounded with horrific results outside of Syria's borders killing hundreds of French and Russian citizens in only the past three weeks. Vladimir Putin has demonstrated true leadership on tackling terrorism in Syria and beyond. As the old English proverb goes, cometh the hour, cometh the man. However, more troubling problems is this, how many other statesmen are willing, willing to do the decent thing and follow the Russian lead? Russia's policy on Syria is the morally and legally correct one. The Paris and Russian airliner massacres, as well as other recent terror atrocities in Lebanon, Iraq, Yemen, and other countries, cry out for a real anti-terror effort based on respecting sovereignty and abiding by international law. That challenge will expose those states that have built their policies on Syria out of deeply criminal objectives and methods. Syria is a war Russia intends to win. No ground troops to Syria. Obama's smartest move in eight years. By Mike Whitney for Counterpunch on Information Clearing House. November 18, 2015. Three questions about Paris. 1. Was the over-the-top, no-holds-barred, 24-7 media blitz really an attempt to keep the public informed about a critically important event, or was the coverage geared to pressure President Obama into sending ground troops to Syria? 2. Is Obama's excuse for not putting boots on the ground in Syria to fight ISIS credible? Obama says he believes the current strategy is ultimately going to work, quote-unquote. Or is the administration afraid of a confrontation with Russia? 3. Does the media's coverage of the attacks in Paris, similar attacks which took place in Beirut, 
Baghdad and Turkey were treated as mere footnotes, reflect a pervasive racist attitudes in the West? Or is it another example of our dreary agenda-driven media? While there's no question that the victims of this horrific crime deserve all of our sympathy and support, there's also no question that the media has exploited the attacks to serve their own purposes. From the moment the attacks were first announced on Friday until today, the media has conducted a full-blown, round-the-clock propaganda campaign that reenacted every bomb blast, every screeching siren, every lurid detail in order to generate as much fear in the public mind as possible. The objective in fueling this mass hysteria became apparent to me after watching all five political talk shows on Sunday where the consensus view of all the interviewees was, quote, ISIS is evil. Obama needs to do something. Obama sends need to send troops into Syria. <clears throat> For example, Jeff Jeb Bush says to George Stephanopoulos, quote, "We need to show leadership. We need no fly zones. We need ground troops." Not to be outdone, Weekly Standard editor Bill Crystal said, "We need 50,000 troops to take Raqqa." Shortly after, Farid Zakaria of GPS chimed in with his completely phony, heartfelt appeal for U.S. intervention. He said, excerpt, quote, Imagine if the world responded by joining forces and doing exactly what's necessary to eradic eradicate a caliphate that only leaves carnage in its wake. Maybe, just maybe, the Democratic president can mobilize the world to respond accordingly. Maybe it will be enough to simply neuter the culprits, not eviscerate the whole population of the region, causing intractable blowback. Can you believe it? He candidly admits that U.S. intervention could eviscerate the whole population of the region and cause intractable, intractable blowback. But he wants to go for it anyway. Unbelievable. Of course, none of the news programs allowed anyone opposed to U.S. warmongering anywhere near a microphone. Can't have that. The unwavering uniformity of opinion just shows that the media wants more war, which is why they're waving the bloody shirt of Paris to pressure Obama. They don't care about the victims. What matters to them is their agenda. But the strategy isn't working. Not this time, at least. In fact, Obama is actually digging in his heels. On Monday, in a truly extraordinary press conference following the G20 summit, Obama announced that he wasn't going to send ground troops to Syria after all. He said he thought, quote, it would be a mistake. You could have heard a pin drop after he made his statement. And then, of course, the press corps went into full attack mode. Not send troops. How can you not send troops after all the terrorist hype we've been spewing for two days straight? We demand you send troops. The media's indignation was apparent by the questions they leveled at Obama after his brief presentation. And what was amazing about the questions was that all five questions were exactly the same question. <laughs> I'm not making this up. The entire pathetic Q&A can be read here. Take a look. First question, Jerome Cartillier of AFP. Question, Mr. President, 129 people were killed in Paris on Friday night. ISIL claimed responsibility for the massacre, sending the message that they could now target civilians all over the world. The question has clearly ch changed. The equation has clearly changed. Isn't it time for your strategy to change? Subtext to question, we want you to send ground troops. Second question, Margaret Brennan, CBS News. Mr. President, a more than year long bombing campaign in Iraq and in Syria has failed to contain the ambition of the and the ability of ISIS to launch attacks in the West. Have you underestimated their abilities? And will you widen the rules of engagement for U.S. forces to take more aggressive action? Subtext to question, we want you to send ground troops. Third question, Jim Avila, ABC News. Mr. President, in the days and weeks before the Paris attacks, did you receive warning in your daily intelligence briefing that an attack was imminent? If not, does that not call into question the current assessment that there is no immediate, specific, credible threat to the United States today? Subtext to question, you have no idea what ISIS is doing, so why not send in ground troops? <laughs> For fourth question, Jim Acosta, CNN. Mr. President, a lot of Americans have this frustration that they see that the United States has the greatest military in the world, 
It has the backing of nearly every other country in the world when it comes to taking on ISIS. I guess the question is, and if you'll forgive the language, is why can't we take out these bastards? Yeah, don't you just love how the media, a guy who works for CNN, proposes to, to speak for the American public? The American public have frustration. American public do this and that. I speak for the American public. It's a joke. Subtext to question. We want you to send ground troops. Fifth question, Ron Allen, NBC News. Mr. President, I think a lot of people around the world and in America are concerned because given the strategy that you're pushing... ISIS's capabilities seem to be expanding. Were you aware that they had the capability of pulling off the kind of attack that they did in Paris? Are you concerned? And do you think that they have the same capability to strike in the United States? Subtext to question, we should be doing more. We want you to send ground troops. Are these really the questions a journalist would ask if he wanted to inform the public on a critical foreign policy matter? Or are they merely a way of hectoring the president so he does what the power brokers who own the media want him to do? By the way, Obama snapped about halfway through the Q&A mainly because he just got frustrated with the tedious repetition of the same question. By the time he got to Jim Acosta, he blurted out angrily, I just spent the last three questions answering that very question, so I don't know what more you want me to add. <laughs> really? Well, okay, it's, it's come full circle. <laughs> but don't kid yourself, Obama knows what's going on. He knows the bigwig media owners who sit on the same board of directors with the big weapons manufacturers. Mm, well, probably true. The Wall Street bankers and other honchos in the military-industrial complex, MIC, want another war. That's what it's all about. That's why they have trained all their cameras on Paris to make sure that every wailing woman, every candle lit vigil, and every bloody victim is filmed up close and personal to maximize the emotional impact and help generate momentum for another U.S.-led massacre in the Middle East. But Obama's not going to go that route. <laughs> Imagine that. I agree with Obama's stance. He's not going to expand the war, not because he's opposed to violence or squeamish about killing innocent people. Heck no. That has nothing to do with it. There's, here's the reason he, he gave at the press conference. President Obama, quote, Well, keep in mind what we have been doing. We have a military strategy that is putting enormous pressure on ISIL through airstrikes, but that has put assistance and training on the ground with Iraqi forces. We're now working with Syrian forces as well to squeeze ISIL and cut off their supply lines. We've been coordinating internationally to reduce their financing capabilities, the oil that they're trying to ship outside. We are taking strikes against high-value targets, including most recently against the individ individual who was on the video executing civilians who had already been captured, as well as the head of ISIL in Libya. Well, <laughs> if that's true, uh, it that's... <laughs> That, that's that's very, very good news. Even as we grieve with our French friends, we can't lose sight that there has been progress being made. Quote progress, a four and a half year stalemate followed by Russian-led military campaign that has rolled back all the gains the U.S.-backed jihadis made in their effort to topple Assad. Obama calls that progress. Well, yeah, okay, I, it, it is kind of a joke, yes. Let's be blunt, U.S. policy in Syria has gone off a cliff. It's a complete and utter disaster. Obama knows that. He's just making lame excuses. Here's more. President Obama, quote, There have been a few who suggested that we should put large numbers of U.S. troops on the ground and keep in mind that we have the finest military in the world and we have the finest military minds in the world and I've been meeting with them intensively for years now, discussing these various options and... It is not just my view, but the view of my closest military and civilian advisors, that that would make a mistake, that, that would be a mistake, not because our military could not march into Mosul or Raqqa or Ramadi and temporary, temporarily clear out ISIL, but because we would see a repetition of what's seen before, which is if you do not have local populations that are committed to inclusive governments, and who are pushing back against ideological extremes, that they resurface unless we're prepared to have a permanent occupation of these countries. 
Yeah, it's because their ideological extremes are not the same as the sovereign nation of Syria. That's basically what it boils down to. If they were to win the war on the ground war in Syria, they would still have an enemy in Syria. Yeah. And let's assume that we were to send 50,000 troops into Syria. What happens when there's a terrorist attack generated from Yemen? Do we then send more troops into there? Or Libya, perhaps? Or if there's a terrorist network that's operating anywhere else in North Africa or in Southeast Asia. Yeah, Boko Haram. Can someone please come clear them out in Africa? Okay, so now we're getting closer to the truth. Obama and his top advisors have looked at this mess from all sides and figured out that it's a hopeless cause. So they're not going to send U.S. troops to die for nothing. Good. At least that makes sense. But even that isn't the whole truth. The whole truth is that Obama and crew are worried about Russia. Sure, the politicians do a lot chest-thumping and saber-rattling in their op-eds or when they're bloviating in front of a TV camera. But this is the real deal. Syria is not make-believe. It's a war, and it's a war Russia intends to win. And if the U.S. gets in Russia's way by setting up a safe zone within Syria's sovereign borders or doing something else stupid like that, there's going to be trouble. Obama knows this because he's a reasonable man. Immoral, but reasonable. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he's not a, a hothead like John McCain or a foam with the mouth basket case like Hillary Clinton. Obama is cut in the mold of James Baker, a dyed in the wool imperialist who understood the parameters of imperial power. There are limits to power, and a wise man will acknowledge those limits and act accordingly. That's what Obama is doing. <laughs> well, that's what his advisors are doing. He's decided that the rewards are just not worth the risk, so he's cutting his losses and backing down. That doesn't mean Washington's plans for Syria has been abandoned. It just means that Obama wants to run out his time in office without dragging the country into another pointless bloodbath. If you ask me, it's the smartest move he's made in eight years.